Okay, the lesson you're looking at right now is a lesson on analyzing graphs, charts, and other visuals. Some of you may be thinking, well, wait a second, is this for math class? Is this for art class? No, this is for your English classes because one of the things that you need to be able to do to be a literate person or a person that can read is not just read words, but be able to read graphics, images, charts, and other informations. Because as you look at different readings and different texts and everything like that, a lot of times, very many times, there will be charts and graphs and things like that for you to interpret as well. And what we're going to do today is we're going to go through and talk about what are the steps to really interpreting and understanding charts and visuals. So if you look at the title of our presentation, it's Look versus See. There's a difference between just looking at something and then really seeing something, and we're going to explore that a little bit today. For the first part of this lesson, we're going to look at analyzing graphs specifically. This is the most common thing you'll see in testing environments and things like that, is you're going to be asked to look at a lot of different kinds of graphs where information is organized a lot of different kinds of ways. And you're going to be you're going to need to be able to be familiar with those things and to be able to interpret them and get the message that, that the creators wanted you to get out of it. So there are some steps that you need to take when analyzing a graph and I'm going to go through those right now. The first step is to determine what type of graph you're looking at. Okay, there, There's not a specific format of graph where every graph you look at is going to look exactly the same, but are, there are some ways of organizing information that are kind of typical. And if you can identify some of the basic formats, you can usually spot what type of graph it is. Again, it won't always look like it has in math class or in elementary school. T sometimes it'll look a little different, but if you can notice these components, you can understand what type of graph it is. And if you can understand what type of graph it is, you can begin interpreting the information and the argument of the graph a lot quicker. So the four primary types of graphs that you'll run into are starting, we'll start with this one, it's a bar graph. And you're probably familiar with this, a bar graph, right? The reason it's called a bar graph is it has these bars in it. And so when you see something like that, that would be a bar graph. This is what they look like in general, okay? Um, the next would be a line graph. You're probably familiar with these. A line graph looks something like this. There are points plotted with lines in between, things going up and down. That's a line graph. There are pie charts, and they're not always perfect circles, but usually there's something circular with slices like out of a pie in them, and pie graphs, okay, pie charts. And then, last but not least, there are scatter plots, and these are useful, useful for some more complicated pieces of information, and we're going to talk about all of these today. The next thing you need to be aware of is that every graph, no matter which type, has titles and labels and that these titles and labels the little smallest information on a graph is very very important many times the small print on a graph can give you information that tells you like how much or what ways things are being measured that can totally change the way you interpret the graph so one of the most important rules to analyzing a graph is to read every tiny title and label. If you do not read everything, if you do not see it and look at it closely, you will misinterpret the graph. So for instance, we can look at this simple example here, and this says, uh, this is a bar graph, and it's cataloging students' favorite juices. Obviously, I would think this is elementary school. I don't know. We all like juice, so that's okay. All right, so the title of the graph is usually up top somewhere, but it can appear anywhere. This is telling us what this is measuring, students' favorite juices, okay? It tells us the number of students, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. So obviously they're going in increments of 2. Now sometimes you might see small print over here that says, you know, measured in thousands. And that would tell us that 2,000 students, right? Um, and then each color of juice, red juice, orange juice, yellow juice, purple juice, right? So that's important that you read the labels and, and understand what parts of the graph are there. The next step 
would be to start thinking about what trends or patterns you see in the graph. What trends or patterns you see in the graph. This is when you really start interpreting the graph. So when you look at a graph like this, you read the labels income, how much money someone's making over here, and then education, how high their education is, how much uh, schooling they've had. You can look at this graph and start drawing some conclusions. One pattern we might notice is that most of the dots fall in this region right here, and they're more close together here. And as you go this way, they start spreading out more, and then there's a few out here. So whatever this is telling us, it looks like there's a high concentration on the lower end of the scale, which we could say it means the lower your education, the less income you're likely to make according to this chart, right? Let's look at another example. What patterns do you see in this one? The grade level, we could see a pattern. It usually, it mostly increases, the, the math score percent increases every year, except for one year. That would be something important to look at and examine. Why was there a dip in 10th grade? That's where you start interpreting a graph. What looks odd? That brings us to this point. Are there outliers? So once you've determined whether uh, what the basic pattern is, where you see most of the things grouping together, where you see the highest things, then are there some odd things in that graph? Are there some things that maybe aren't fitting in with the pattern, right? So we have this pattern where most of them kind of go through this area here. But then we have two up here. Are these outliers, what we would call outliers? Um, what does that tell us? What should we take away from that? Okay. Um, you can look at this. What are the outliers? Again, on this graph, it increases every year. What's the one exception to that? The one outlier. It goes down in 10th grade. So it's important to recognize this because that's an important piece of information. It's showing where there's something happening. And you have to pay attention to when you see those outliers. That's very important when you're interpreting graphs and charts. The next step is then after you've seen all those things, you've looked for patterns, you've looked for the, the points or, or the parts of the graph that don't fit the pattern, then you start drawing conclusions. This is where you start actually interpreting the information and making some decisions about it. For instance, in this graph, we're marking how much money someone makes according to how much education they have. We can draw the conclusion that for the most part you see this big group down here the less education you have the less money you make if we were to draw a line through the middle of this it would kind of go like this and that would tell us that as your education increases so does the amount of money you receive but then we would have to also draw conclusions that it's not always true right we have someone here with 12 that's making more than anyone and there's someone up here making a lot more than everyone else and there's someone over here at 14 making a little lower so there's some conclusions we can still draw from that for instance in this graph we could draw the conclusion that out of all the words in the English language over half of the words are nouns so we can draw that conclusion from here um, from this chart, we could draw the conclusion that not very many students like red juice. A lot of them like yellow juice. If you follow those five steps for analyzing a graph, it will help you interpret that graph and know where to start and in what order to go through to get the information you're supposed to get from each graph. So let's try this out. Take a minute to look at this graph. In a second, go ahead and pause this video. Use the steps we just talked about and decide uh, what information you can get out of this graph. Go ahead and pause the video. Okay, hopefully you were able to interpret this graph, right? One of the keys to understanding this graph is, like we said, reading all of the labels on the graph. We would want to we would want to read this, the title of the graph. Quarterback's first game passing yards. How many yards are they passing for in their first game? And there's a little description here. So much for tempering expectation. RG3's debut performance, 300 passing yards and an upset win over the Saints on September 9th stacks up well against some active stars. Then we can look at the labeling of the graph. Obviously this area is measuring 
the debut passing yards or how many passing yards a player had, a quarterback had on their first game ever in the NFL. And the, that yardage is marked starting with 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. So we know as things are going higher on this graph, that means there are more passing yards happening there. And there's also a color scheme going here. So we see red and blue and red and blue, blue. What does that mean? Well, if you look down here on the bottom, it says if it's blue, the bar is blue, that means that that team won. And if the bar is red, that means that team lost. So the two teams that, the two players that lost their opening game ever in the NFL were Peyton Manning and Cam Newton, while Robert Griffin III, Aaron Rodgers, and Drew Brees all won their first game in the NFL. But we can look at this graph and very quickly see who was the be who had the best first game in the NFL. It's very clearly the tallest part of the graph, Cam Newton, who had the worst game, Drew Brees. How did it talked about in this little passage over here? It talked about RG3, Robert Griffin III. How did he do compared to the others? Well, looks like he was second. And you could make the case his team won and Cam Newton's lost. So you, you can make a case that he had the best first performance ever based on this info and this info. Interpreting graphs are all about the details. Let's move on. Let's take a look at this graph. This obviously is more this graph is obviously more like a pie chart. Let's take a look at it real quick. How about that bout? Mayweather's usual forty million a fight. Payday is pennies compared with the potential from a fight with Manny Pacquiao. A longtime boxing executive says the showdown would easily be the world's first quarter billion dollar fight, with pay per view buys alone generating $175 million. Here's a breakdown of the likely take, which the camps disagree on how to split. So, if we look at the labels of this graph, first we would see that the total take, that means the total amount, if all, if someone got all of the whole pie chart, would be $250 million. And then of that $250 million, it's broke up into one, two, three, four parts. There's a large chunk that has 70%, and then three equal smaller chunks at 10%. And we can look up here, and what they're doing in this graph is matching the colors. So we can look on here and see. Pay-per-view, $175 million. Site fee, $25 million. International, $25 million. Miscellaneous, $25 million. So the largest portion of the payout comes from people buying and watching the fights on pay-per-view. That's 70% of the graph. Let's look at another one. Here's where graphs can look a little strange. This does not look right off the bat, like any of the graphs that we looked at of the four types that we're familiar with. But if we take a little bit of time to look, look at it and think about how it's laid out and how it's measuring things, we would realize that this most closely resembles a bar graph, right? There are bars of information, and the higher the bar goes, the more of something there are. In this case, this is the most common nicknames among college teams. So the names of their mascot. And in all of college football, the most common mascot name by 45 teams are the Eagles. A lot of schools with the name Eagles. And some of the lower ones are Vikings or Devils or Bearcats, right? They're less on that list. So just because it doesn't look like a standard graph doesn't mean it doesn't fit with one of the standard graph types. This is obviously a very creative way of doing a bar graph. But if you understand the basic types of graph, you can look at the way they set up any one and kind of determine the same thing. Again, this one's kind of like a bar graph. It's kind of almost like a pie chart with size mattering as well on here. This is a graph of how many mentions each one of these players got on ESPN over the course of a year, right? And each player, coach, person involved in football is represented on here. And the larger they are, obviously, the more mentions they had, right? So even though this graph looks unusual, we would be able to see that Jim Harbaugh did not have as many mentions as Peyton Manning. Right? We can clearly see that by looking at the visual very quickly. So that, that should tell you how to look at a graph and interpret it. The little 
parts of the graph. The little labels, the little explanations and descriptions are often the most important parts. So if you're asked to interpret the graph, look at every little part. We can also analyze images. This part of the presentation has to do with looking at a photo and what are some things you should think about when you analyze an image. So we have two images on the screen. One is a famous photograph of Muhammad Ali knocking out Sonny Liston in the first minute of the first round of their boxing match. And the other one is a famous picture of Michael Jordan after winning his first NBA championship, crying and holding his NBA trophy. We're going to look at analyzing these images and the steps we should take. So the first thing you need to do when you're analyzing an image or a photo is to think about what's your immediate first reaction. How does that image make you feel? What's unique about the image? What jumps out to you most about the image? So when we look at this picture, what jumps out to most of us first is the fact that Whoever this guy's standing up here, he clearly is winning the fight and yelling something at this guy. So he is definitely dominant in this picture. He's winning, right? Um, so that's maybe our first impression. After that, we should look closely then at the details. We've got an overall impression. The next step to analyzing a photo is to look at the details. When you look at it more closely, what details do you notice? What small things might be important? Go back to this picture. We can look at the details of the faces in the crowd. How are they reacting? Do they look happy about it? What people are doing? Is this an important moment? Look how many cameras are taking pictures of it. What facial expression is the main dominant photo making? All those details can give us more information to interpret the photo. The next part would be to consider the context. What's going on around the action of the image? What about the surroundings add to the meaning or feeling of the image? Similar to looking at details, look and see what you see around. For instance, in this photo, the photographer intentionally tried to make the background of the photo darker to make them stand out more. What does that tell us? Is this person important? What action is important? That context can tell us a lot. By looking at the context, we can tell around what time period this is. Is this today? Is this earlier in, in the 1900s? When is this? Um, and if you look closely, you might recognize fashion of the 1960s, of that kind of time. That would help you understand the context. The next step would be to... Think about how the image was created. In this case, was this a photo? This was a photo. Who took it? Why did they take it? Was it planned? Was it candid? Was anything added or changed? Is it color or black and white? Why? These are all good questions to ask. Candid means, was it, was it taken just without the people in the image knowing that it was taken? So we can go back here, and we can, we can clearly see this is not a posed picture. There's so much action going on. We can safely assume that this is a photo that was taken in the moment of the action happening and not a recreation. So it's capturing an important part of history. Finally, put it all together. Now that you've considered all the parts of the image, what do you think the person who created it was trying to say with it? What point were they trying to make? Maybe they were trying to make the argument in this picture that Muhammad Ali is one of the greatest boxers of all time. Maybe they're trying to make the point that Muhammad Ali is an angry man. In either case, this picture is making a lot of statements, and that's what we have to pay attention to when we're analyzing a visual. I want you to think about these steps. What's your first reaction? Looking closely at the details. Considering the context. Thinking about how it was created. And then putting it all together. And I want you to take a second and pause the video and look at this photo of Michael Jordan receiving his first NBA trophy. And I want you to interpret this photo using those steps. Go ahead and pause the video. Hopefully you were able to interpret this video and get some good ideas about what argument this photo is making. What's it trying to say about championships, about Michael Jordan, about basketball, about all those things in our country. Hopefully you were able to draw some conclusions using those steps. Hopefully this lesson was helpful in teaching you how to look at graphs more closely and how to analyze images and graphs and what steps you should take in trying to figure those things out.
If you have any more questions about these things, be sure to talk to one of your teachers.